So I think my mic has been turned on. Uh, and when we slice, it's really using the edge of the blade. Now, if you're uh, a chef or you use a, a knife in a sort of a culinary uh, cutting work, so like the sushi chefs or any of the chefs that cook in restaurants, when it comes to slicing, the blade has to be very, very sharp. And even a razor, by pressing into it, that doesn't actually do it. What cuts is the drawing mechanism. So in order to sever the, the tissue or the cells, you need to have to draw across. So the idea is that when you slice, you slice, it has to be one continuous stroke with a bit of pressure in a direction. Now, slicing through tissue is, you know, fairly gentle. Now, if that same tissue is frozen, like a piece of meat coming out of the freezer, you can't slice through it because the, the cells are so dense they're in, a, in that frozen state. So you have to use something like an ax. So you really kind of force your way through it. Unless you just use something that's moving at a very high speed, then you can kind of cut through it uh, easily. But slicing is really something that is a drawing of the sword. So we have slicing in multi-dimensions. Slicing up, slicing up, slicing diagonally on oblique lines. So these oblique lines are 45. So you notice that would be 45. And if you want to slice completely, the turning of the waist, the turning of the body, the shifting of the weight creates the direction of movement and the action in the slice. Okay, the upward cut, the cut, most of it is up here. When you're cutting down, most of it is there. Okay, when we're slicing this way, horizontally, it's the turning of the waist, the turning of the shoulders, and the spreading of the hands. Okay, when we poke, this is different from actually slicing. It's stabbing. But again, if this wasn't shaped like this, it penetrates first and then it starts to kind of slice inward because of the curve. If it was like a chisel and it's flat, then it just hits a blunt spot and then it doesn't go anywhere because it can't penetrate. It has to be turned up or down in order to create a slicing. So, you know, the design of these apparatuses have their mechanical advantage. So mechanical advantage is, you know, how do you utilize it so you have like a, a fulcrum or a pivot or a, an action that allows, you know, uh, this cutting to penetrate. So when we do the form, that's exactly what we're trying to replicate, right? And when we're in this starting position and we open the form, we have this sword here, and we come up, and we turn like this, and then we turn, and then this act is an action as well. And then we come up to here, one, two, three, as grass the sparrow's tail, and then we're here. Okay? So, if I do this facing this way, then you're going to see the movements going this way, which might be easier to track. So preparation, we start off like this. So here's your side view. The only movement you're going to see facing you at this point is going to be the grasp of Sparrow's tail movement. When I turn the corner, right side hand movement, turning to the left side brush push. So this is the brush and the push. The sit back, grasp the sword, put your hand behind the blade, step up and push. Turn like this, go to the front, go to the side, that's the starting position side, to the corner, 
and we thrust. Sit back. Turn. Open. Stab. Flip. And we're in that corner. Now we go to the opposite back corner. We slice up. Flip the sword over. Step back and poke. Now we sit back here to turn. Shift your weight and poke. Shift your weight, center position, step out 45 degrees and separate the hands. This goes like this, I shift the weight, kick up, step down, we'll sink poke and we're here. Turn, slice over the top, sit back and up like that. Okay, then you're gonna heel kick, step down, push the sword forward, sit back, turn, step up, <clears throat> turn, invert the sword, chop down, turn this way, uppercut, sit back, turn, sit back, and push. Okay, once we finish that movement, we're gonna turn, and now I'm facing you, and I poke. So to so take this position, I'm gonna turn it over to here, okay? So we just did this slice, and we're here. I sit back, turn, so everything is from the back side. Even though this isn't exactly how the form is mapped out, you're gonna see the movements and you can track it directly from behind. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so we're here. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, Five. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that actually would happen there, but if I were to do it on the back side, you would see it as one, two, three, four, Five, six, one, two, three. Okay, and then if I did it like this, then I have one more movement that takes me to this side, and I drop it down, and I end up here. And we do the sliding step one, two, three, four. And then I would be heading in that direction. 
one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then if I would draw, I would turn like this. One, two, three, four, five, and I'm back here to six, and if I step like this, I would go to that corner, and I would shift my weight, unweight, drop down, and poke. And all of those movements actually happen if we're doing the mapped out form over in the, those two sides. Okay, so uh, let's go back to um, this position. All right, so we have one, two, three. This goes as a block, two, and I turn to there, okay? Now with that position, I'm here, and it would go over, over, here, one, two, three, poke, withdraw, turn, one, two, and then just repeats till I get to here. And I would go over there and then face you like that. Okay. So once we're in this position, okay, and I step back, I would have to do it from here. And I would step back. One, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So this trying to give you the back view of those different postures because a lot of times when we just run through the form, you can see it, but you're seeing it from a side view sometimes, you're seeing it from the mirror image sometimes, you're seeing it from the opposite side sometimes. So it gets a little confusing if you're trying to track that form and it just uh, doesn't work very well when you're doing um, you know, sort of three-dimensional mapped out space in a single camera view. Um, we do have a camera over there, but a lot of the cameras that we have, uh, you know, on the other side, so we're not using the five camera view right now. So let's just go through that section as if it's uh, mapped out. That's the front side, and we can see if we can follow that, all right? Ready? Opening. We'll just get up to that section, see if you can track it.
Oops, sorry. Here. Now we're going to turn and we repeat this section again. Just turn left. Okay, so this, uh, say we, we're here, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. 
four, five. So this position is here, one, two, three. I turn to here so I can cut, cut over the top, come up through here, use my shoulder, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Okay, good. So you can see, you know, all, this, all the uh, movements that we do, it requires a certain amount of spatial awareness, uh, and that's part of proprioception, and sensitivity, and, you know, sensitivity ties into um, sort of tactile sen sensitivity. We can feel that we're holding something here, we feel we're holding something here, but you're also resting it on your forearm. So you develop some feeling there. When you lift your arm, when, you, when it's on your shoulder and you're lifting the sword over, you have some awareness factors coming into here where you're supporting it or the hand comes to here, or when you switch your hands and you be, develop some sort of uh, dexterity in your movements because uh, dexterity and agility, they kind of work hand in hand. It's much more of a refinement of motion and that dexterity has to be the nimbleness that you develop. So nimbleness, agility, dexterity, that's all uh, sort of intricate movement because it requires timing, sensitivity, and movements that require uh, a more complicated uh, program that allows that to happen. So you're engaging more things, more finger control, more foot control, more toe control, more awareness of the body, you know, the sensitivity of a, a hand position so that you're here. I'm touching my arm here, so I have a feeling when it's in that position, you can detect that you're in the right position. If the elbow is not right or all of this is not right, you can feel if the position's correct from the experience that you've gained and, uh, and the discovery from doing it over time. You know, most of our learning is really a discovery and a discovery of understanding. We really don't uh, understand much of what we take in visually because we're just uh, mimicking. We're doing a mirror image of it when we're learning. Uh, it's just that capacity that we have. And if we only rely on the mirroring and that memory doesn't mean that you have any deeper understanding. The deeper understanding comes from doing it, experiencing it, and going through sort of the changes that you'll um, bring into learning it that's uh, you know really uh, deleting you know maybe erroneous motion erroneous strength um, deleting anything that you might have thought you were supposed to be doing and then at the same time you're correcting it by doing it by what you're hearing or being uh, you know, sort of instructed to, to do. So when we're in a vertical position, we're talking about sun align, 45 degrees, 45 degrees, horizontal. You know, these I call the geometry and position, and I use geometry a lot because, you know, geometry plays a major role in, you know, structures, in, you know, whether it's um, a building or your body, it uses structures and these structures <clears throat> are the pieces that hold you know you together which is your skeleton <clears throat> and the framework of a, a building which is really um, if it's a wooden building then it's easy to say it's the two by fours or the two by sixes whichever it is that you frame out the boxes <clears throat> and you put a cover on it and that's like the framing is really your skeleton the cover is your skin, and then what you're housing inside essentially is whatever you decide to put in there. 
but that's something that's, you know, uh, a system as, as in the home. But in the body, what's inside are your organs. And, you know, you're in, a, in itself one system. And it's just amazing what that system is able to do. It houses everything that you need to, to sustain life and to be, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, an active person by feeding yourself, breathing, and all this. So all this stuff happens through movement. I call, uh, I say movement is essential to life, so why is it important to move? Um, not just random movement, it has to be programmed movement, and it has to be systematized in a sense that we, we're doing this mind-body relationship, and we're answering questions that's running through our head, and we're, the body's responding, and it's this give and take, and you can do this uh, forever. You actually do this till the day you die, but the thing is, um, you have to have a method, a way. And, you know, so the method to this madness, learning sequences, whether it's forms, um, exercises, you know, everything that we do is actually supporting, you know, this mechanism. We all learn things the same way, and by learning it the specific way, we start to begin to understand. Um, Habits are something that's created. Habits can be good, habits can be bad. But the thing is, with movement, it's evol evolving. It, it's you evolve, it's an evolution. You begin to understand and the slices come into play that at a specific angle, when you're in a stance, you know, what is this? So it comes down to intention, your mind intent. In Tai Chi, we talk about using your mind to direct the movement. So the mind intent is something that um, we have sometimes described as maybe willpower, the willing to do something, but our mind is constantly active thinking about what's going to happen next. So, you know, it's just a, a way of thinking of it. You know, I think along those lines because um, this is what I've experienced over the years of practice, you know, why this has to be held a certain way. What does it feel like to have different grips and the nimbleness of your hand and fingers? Um, it just really evolves. Um, and your hands, they're always subject to some kind of injury if you're doing, it, so, doing something wrong. In fact, last Saturday, my middle finger, that middle joint, uh, was stiff. And I must have done something that I didn't realize doing. I didn't hit anything. I didn't bang anything. But I might have picked up something wrong because I've been doing some um, cabinet work and I might have done something there that I didn't know. But it got inflamed. And uh, what I did was I, you know, I massaged my finger to get circulation in it and I felt the joint and whether it was out of, uh, out of position or not. And, um, you know, within about 12 hours of doing that, you know, it did turn discolored here. So there was some, some kind of capillary breakage in there and it would turn, it was kind of a bruising, but it wasn't, and it was, so by the end of the day, the movement would, would came back and then overnight, you know, the remedy, and then now the, the finger is back to normal. It doesn't, I don't have that problem, but it's usually fluids that accumulate in the joint and um, but when I pressed on it like this and held it first and then released it, it there was a little bit of a, a click and it, um, you know, that might have been the resetting of it. And then it, and then it just, you know, to the circulation of moving, it just came back. So, you know, your body does respond um, to things. So with movement, your body does actually go through this process and you start to build. So, you know what was going on there was inflammation. And that inflammation, you know, was dissipated by getting it to move out of that joint. And, you know, that was something. But I do a lot of those kind of things, you know, because I can sense that there's something not right there. So anyways, um, that's it for the, the broad. So I hope that was helpful. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, I know Susan watches Bill, um, but I send you that thing. I'm going to be uh, trying to do some uh, Zoom things, and I'll I'll email you about that. Uh, I'll see you next time, and I'll maybe see you. Uh, we have Sunday Tai Chi out in the backyard, 
in the field. Um, if the weather's good, you know, we've been lucky. We've had good weather every Sunday. So uh, hopefully it's, it's kind of a long weekend. Um, so I don't know if people are away, but uh, I'll be there. I'll be there on Sunday. I'll see you then, 9.30 Sunday morning.